In this problem, we are trying to find the equations of motion, the natural frequencies, and the mode shapes for our multi-degree of freedom system. We don't need to find the entire solution for it, uh, so most of the work in this is going to be in our modeling step. We want equations of motion, natural frequencies, uh, which will have multiple, and our mode shapes, which will have multiple. So I'll just indicate that with these vectors. Okay, so we have our system here. We have three masses. Everything is connected by springs. We are going to need to start with our model. Uh, in this case, no degrees of freedom are uh, given to us, so we can designate our own. So I'm going to say that x1 is going to be the vertical position or deformation of m, and x2 I will define as the displacement of 2m, and x3 will be of this bottom m. I've decided to define them all as positive down uh, just for convenience here, but again, if you want to do positive up for some of them or all of them, that's also okay, as long as you're consistent. And these are all inertial uh, measurements or inertial frames, so these are the absolute deformations or deflections or displacements. So we're going to need our, to get our equation of motion, uh, we want to use Lagrange's equations, especially as we're going to these higher and higher dimensional systems. It's going to make our lives easier. And looking at the system we have here, just to verify how many independent degrees of freedom we have, because all of the masses are connected by these springs, we can imagine if we hold, for example, x1 and x2 at zero, we can still move that m at x3 at the bottom up and down without x1 and x2 being affected. If we hold x2 and x3 at zero, hold them still, we can still move m without um, knowing what x2 and x3 are or without affecting x2 and x3. And x1 and x3 can be held at zero and we can move x2 up and down without affecting the other two. So this is a situation where we have three independent degrees of freedom. Knowing any one or two of them does not automatically let us know what the third one is. So going to the model, let's start with the easier, typically easier thing to model, which is the kinetic energy, since this is usually everything is absolute here. So we have to look at everything that has kinetic energy in our system. The way we're modeling this, the way we are assuming our masses can move, we can, they can only move vertically, not horizontally, they cannot rotate. So m, the 2m, and the m at the bottom have only translational kinetic energy. So we're going to have three terms here. I will start at the top m, so 1 half times its mass times its velocity squared. We're using absolute velocity here, so just x1 dot squared plus 1 half times 2m x2 dot squared. I'm not going to combine the 1 half and the 2 uh, because we're going to be differentiating this in a following step, so I'll just leave it like that. And then the energy in the third mass, the one at the bottom, one half, its mass is just m, and its velocity is x3 dot, and that gets squared. So that is everything we need for the kinetic energy here. That is the value of t. Now we can write v, the potential energy. We are ignoring the gravitational potential of the masses. The only elements with potential energy will be the springs. And if we count them up, there's six springs. So there'll be six terms in V that we need to account for. So let's go here. Uh, let me just mark them. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, I will go top to bottom. Uh, so that first K, that first spring, is attached to the ceiling and it's attached to the mass that has a displacement of x1. So that will be a 1 half k times its net displacement, its net deformation is x1 and that gets squared. Now, technically I could do x1 plus 0 or minus 0 and square that, but that's just going to be the x1. Now we can move on to this, the next spring. So I will look at the spring between the top M and 2M. So in this case, both sides of it, the top and the bottom, can move. So again, we want the net displacement here. 1 half, its stiffness is K, 
And now what's its net displacement? Let's look at the two degrees of freedom it's attached to. And again, consider like we did for two degrees of freedom, if the spring is to be put into tension, what should the sign on each end of this be? Let's look at the, K, the x2 side, the bottom of it. This spring will be put into tension when x2 is positive. So I will put down a positive or a plus x2. Let's look at the top of the spring. The spring will be put into tension if x1 is negative. So a minus x1. And that gets squared. The order wouldn't have mattered. I could have said it's negative x1 plus x2. Uh, it's exactly the same thing as I have written here. Let's go down to the next spring, that next k spring. At the bottom, it's attached to m, which is attached to x3. At the top, it's attached to x2. For this spring, if we hold, let's say, x2 constant, x3 being positive would be put, put the spring into tension. If we hold x3 at 0, negative x2 would put it into tension. So I'm always thinking about here, what sign will put it into tension? What sign on the degree of freedom puts the spring into tension if the other degree of freedom would, were to be zero? All right, that's three of them. Moving on to that bottom spring. Now, the bottom is attached to the floor, which does not move, and the top is attached to x3. So that's simply x3 quantity squared. Go back to the top. Let's look at the 3k. What is its net deformation? The top is attached to x1, the bottom x3. If x1 is 0, a positive x3 puts it into tension. And if x3 is 0, a negative x1 puts it into tension. And finally, 1 half times the 2k spring, the last one. At the top, it's attached to x2. And at the bottom, it's attached to the floor, which doesn't move. So that will just be, I can write it as x2 squared. T and V are written in terms of just the independent degrees of freedom. We have selected x1, 2, and 3, and it is a three degree of freedom system, so there's no replacement that needs to happen here. So the modeling step, we are actually ready for, I'll keep it in the modeling step here, we can put these into Lagrange's equations, of which we'll have three. We'll have a d dt del t del x1 dot, so the first equation I'm going to differentiate with respect to the x1 term. And, and you'll see that we have um, no damping, there's, so there's no rally dissipation, and everything's autonomous. There is no forcing acting on the system. So it's just the ddt of del t del x1 dot plus del v del x1 equals zero. So we're going to do this three times. We're going to do it once for each independent degree of freedom. So the second one, I'll differentiate with respect to x2. And then the third equation of motion, I will get when I differentiate with respect to x3 and x3 dot. Now, we can do this by hand. I'm actually going to do this one in Mathematica just to demonstrate how we can use it to do some of the, well here, calculus and algebra for us. And as we get larger and larger systems, it will become more of a pain to, to try to do this by hand. So in this case, I can leave V exactly as is. I don't need to foil out those squares because Mathematica will do that work for us. In Mathematica, I'm going to first really just enter the equations I already have, the kinetic energy equation. I have 1 half times m times, so this will be a little bit new, I'm going to say it's x1 prime of t, and that gets squared. So do pay attention here of the x1 term. Make sure, one, you're putting a space between the m so it knows it's a separate variable, or you could put a times, either is okay, but I'm putting a space here so it knows that m is its own thing. I'm calling it x1. The prime is the first derivative, which I wrote as a dot on paper, but here it's a prime. And then I have to put bracket t here 
so that Mathematica knows it's a function of time. And that will become important when we do the differentiation step in the Lagrange's equations. So plus 1 half times 2m, and that's times x2 dot of t quantity squared plus 1 half m x3 prime or dot of t squared. Right, make sure everything's entered correctly. Right, so I'm going to run that and I get what I have listed above. Now it did combine the 1 half and the 2. If we were doing it by hand we would leave it. Um, but here once we do the differentiation step Mathematica will know what to do. So t is entered correctly. Now I want to enter my v, my potential energy. So I have a 1 half kx1 of t squared. So there's no dot here because it's just x1. They're not the time derivatives, but I do need to include that t with it. Plus 1 half times k times quantity x2 of t minus x1 of t. And that quantity gets squared. Plus 1 half times k x3 of t minus x x2 of t squared, 1 half times a k, x3 of t squared, plus 1 half times 3k, and here I have x3 minus x1. And then the last time, 1 half times 2k times x2 squared and run it just to double check that it looks correct here. I have my first term, my second term, uh, it put it in a slightly different order. It's trying to group my variables, which we'll do in a little bit here. Uh, but I have one, two, three, four, five, six terms. Uh, it reordered things in a, a little bit of a weird way, but it'll come out in the end. So V is now entered into Mathematica. So it has our T, it has our V. Now we can start letting it do some of the uh, or all of our Lagrange's equations. Now, what we can do, uh, so equation one is going to be, I want to take, well, I'll work from the inside out, I guess. I'm going to start with del t, del x1 dot. How do I do that? So it's del t, x1 of prime. Okay, so the capital D on the outside says I want to do a derivative. Uh, which could be a total or a partial derivative. And then the first term here is, what's the thing I want to differentiate? I want to differentiate t. Again, if it's a partial or a total, it's going to know the difference. And then what variable do I want to differentiate with respect to? x1 dot. Notice again here, uh, I have the prime because it's dot, and I still have that x1 of t. So let me run just that part and make sure it does what we expect it to do. So yes, if we look at t, the only thing affected by that partial derivative is the first term, that two from the squared comes down, and we're left with m x1 dot. But uh, I now need the outside derivative because I want to differentiate that thing by time, little t. So that's where the second derivative, I'm taking the derivative of the derivative of t of x1 dot with respect to t. So this is in the syntax for Mathematica to do now that outside total derivative with respect to t. And notice I have mx1 double prime or double dot uh, of t. So that bracket t just says it's of t. So that's the first term. Now, doing that by hand, that would have been pretty simple. Now I can differentiate though v with respect to x1. So this will save us a little bit of time and that equals zero on the right hand side. So notice it did kind of, um, the way it's displaying it is not great because what we, do we want to do with this? Well, we want to put it into a matrix form, uh, which that will do by hand. So I'm actually gonna suppress this for a moment. I want to use this collect feature. I wanna take that thing, well, I'll unsuppress it for the moment, take the thing above, and now group it in terms of x1 double dot of t, x2 double dot of t, x3 double dot of t. We don't have any single dot terms because there's no um, 
there's no damping in this one, so I can skip those terms. But I am explicitly telling it how to group my coefficients. And we'll see what that looks like. All right, so again, the first line, it is not grouping everything tremendously well. And now this second line, now it's doing what we want. It's grouping the coefficients in front of my degrees of freedom and the second derivatives of my degrees of freedom. And we'll see when we write this out that this is a more convenient way to look at it. So I will suppress that first line because rewritten, uh, collecting all of my coefficients, it is going to be a lot better. So that is my equation one. And the nice thing now that I did that work is I can just copy and paste and just change for my second equation, differentiate with respect to x2. And for my third equation, differentiate with respect to x3. And I can run it all at once. And with copy and paste, I've saved myself a lot of time here. So these are my three equations of motion in scalar form. And I have now done in Mathematica those partial derivative steps with respect to x1, with x2, and with x3. And now my three equations of motion, which I will copy into the paper version. In order to see everything at once, I copied the output from Mathematica, but I'm going to rewrite it now. Uh, so that first equation, I do have to write it in a little bit better way when I'm doing it by hand. So I do want the x1 double dot first. I don't have an x2 double dot or an x3 double dot. I will have a plus 5kx1 minus a kx2 minus 3kx3 equals 0. So notice I'm just leaving room for the x1, uh, x2 and 3 double dots uh, so that's easier to put into matrix form. For the second one, I have a 2m x2 double dot, not 3. There's no x3 double dot term in that second equation. And now I'll have a negative kx1. I have a plus 4kx2 minus kx3 equals 0. And then the third equation, I have just an mx3 double dot minus 3kx1 minus kx2 plus 5kx3 equals 0. So took the output from Mathematica, just rewriting it in the, in the form that is going to be better to work with for that next step. Now with the Lagrange's equations written, I can go and I can write my matrix form of my equation of motion. So it's really just transcribing what I just put together here. So it's going to be a 3 by 3 M matrix now. Uh, so let's, and then also a 3 by 3 K matrix. This will be my x double dot plus my k matrix, give myself plenty of room, x equals 0. So I will now transcribe my first equation into matrix form. I have an m, I have a 0, I have a 0. I have a 5k, negative k, negative 3k. Second equation, nothing in front of the x1 double dot, a 2m in front of the x2 double dot, and a 0, minus k, 4k, minus k. And then the last equation is the last row, just an m, x, 3, double dot, minus 3k, uh, I have a minus k, and a 5k. So just rewriting those three scalar equations into this one matrix form. And now I can identify I have my mass matrix times x double dot plus my stiffness matrix times x equals zero. This should be the zero vector as well. So I have mass matrix, I have stiffness matrix. Before I go on into identifying parameters, let's just make sure that we did the modeling step correctly. We want to check the same is true in two degrees as multi-degrees, M and K for these linear systems must be symmetric. Looking at the mass matrix, it's a diagonal matrix. All diagonal matrices are symmetric, so that's good. And let's look at K. Um, we can ignore the main diagonals. Let's look at the off diagonals. Negative K, negative K, that's good. Negative K, negative K, and negative 3K, negative 3K. So K is also this symmetric matrix 
as is M, so we can proceed. That at least we, we don't know for sure we did something wrong um, because both M and K are symmetric. If one or both of them are not, recheck your equations. So let's look at our identify. Based on our equation of motion, this is going to be, uh, well, three degree of freedom, which falls under multi-degree, or MDOF. It is undamped, or conservative, or non-dissipative. There's no, the C matrix is the zero matrix. There is no damping. We have free vibrations, or it's autonomous, because the right-hand side is the zero vector. It is linear. We were put, able to put everything into a matrix form here. And that's the important stuff. We're not looking for x of t here, so I can skip over that step. But in my parameters, I do still want the natural frequency and the mode shape for this. Now notice here, uh, we don't have numerical values for m or k. We're going to do this one completely algebraically, completely symbolically. And we'll do that also using Mathematica. Back in Mathematica, I'm going to define this M matrix. I'll call it capital M. Uh, now I can do this, I can put it in a matrix using the basic math palette. Um, where does that live? And under palettes, other basic math input. So mine was already open. And one way I can do this is I can click this little template here. Now by default, it just puts in a two by two matrix, but I can make it larger because it, these are going to both be three by three. One way to do it is if I go insert table matrix, add row, add column. So control enter adds a row, control comma adds a column. So I'll just use the keyboard shortcuts to make it bigger. So either way, it's now three by three. And I'm just going to put in what I have in my handwritten part. So that's my M and I'll just save that. And then I will have my K matrix. Uh, it's the same idea. It will be three by three, make it bigger. Uh, and now in this one, I can actually take a little shortcut here since everything has a K. I'm just going to factor that K outside when I'm entering this in. So I don't have to type it over and over again. Right, but we notice that it just puts the K in, but same idea. Actually, I could have done that same thing with M. I'll do that just so it looks the same. I can factor out the M because every term has an M with it. Well, except the zeros, but that doesn't matter because it's still zero. And I can write it that way. So I have my M and I have my K. Now it's symbolic and that's why I'm going to use Mathematica to do this step. Uh, so I want to find the eigenvalues of M inverse times K. Right, so remember in Mathematica, I can use this inverse times M. And then I don't want to do an element by element multiplication. I want to do actual matrix multiplication. So I can use the period or the dot there. And just for display purposes, I want to put this into matrix form just to see what it looks like. Okay, so that's M inverse times K, uh, matrix times K. And again, notice the difference if I use times here, that's not what I want. That does what MATLAB does with dot times. So it's kind of the opposite in Mathematica. A dot does the matrix multiplication between M inverse and K, and that is what I want. Uh, so I'll just call that MK so I can just do this step one time. All right, let's find the eigenvalues. So eigenvalues of MK. And there they are. Um, now remember, those are the eigenvalues, I want the natural frequencies. So I want omega n. So that's going to be the square root of these eigenvalues. And it does kind of uh, as simplified as a Ken version of finding the these eigenvalues uh, or the square roots of the eigenvalues here. And notice these are actually in descending order, which is not really what I want, but uh, I'll just rearrange it when I write these out. And I want then the eigenvectors also. So let's do that on the next line. Now I won't put this in the matrix form uh, because it actually is a little bit counterintuitive, but let's see, let's see what it does look like actually. So actually it's each row of the matrix is associated with one of my eigenvalues. 
So it's, it's different than how MATLAB does it. It's actually probably easier to look at this the way it naturally displays it, where each tuple, like each triple is associated with one of the natural frequencies. So this first triple is associated with this natural frequency, this triple with the second, and then this triple with this. So it's not written exactly the way we would like to, but that is our chi. So I'll take this output and I'm going to put it in the form that we more like this written in. So my natural frequencies are one, I want to do these in ascending order, not descending. So uh, the first one is going to be root k over m. The second one is going to be the square root of 3k over m. And then the third one, the largest one, is 8k over m, since k and m both have to be positive. So I reverse the order that they actually came out of. And I rewrote that 2 root 2 as just root 8 instead. And now they're associated mode shapes or eigenvectors here. Uh, again, I, since I reordered my eigenvalues, I have to reorder these as well. And I'll put these in the more familiar way we have it. So 1, 1, 1, and then 1, negative 1, 1, and then negative 1, 0, 1. So remember that uh, this and this are associated, this and this are associated, and then this and this are associated. So I am writing it in that more familiar way where this will be my chi one, this will be my chi two, and this will be my chi three as I go down the column. So algebraically, these are my natural frequencies and my mode shapes solved symbolically. So notice actually the mode shapes, uh, because everything had a K and an M in it, uh, we did have things cancel out. So these are numeric, there's no symbols in the mode shapes. However, the natural frequencies are dependent on K and on M. Uh, and the first natural frequency is root K over M. That is by chance in a way. I mean, it's the way the system is put together, but you will not be guaranteed that something is going to be root K over M. It looks like the only natural frequency we have in a 1DOF system, but that is a coincidence in this problem. So to recap in this problem, we started with the modeling step. We had to find the total kinetic energy and the total potential energy. Uh, six springs, so six pieces with potential energy. Three masses, so three things with kinetic energy. Use Lagrange's equations, differentiating with each of the three independent degrees of freedom. Uh, used Mathematica to help with that, although we could have done it by hand fairly easily for this one. And that gave us our three scalar equations of motion. Took those three scalar equations of motion and transcribed them into the matrix form equation of motion, where we identified our mass matrix and our stiffness matrix. Now, we left this one symbolically. Uh, oftentimes we have values for the parameters, but here we left in terms of M and K. In the identify step, uh, we saw that since there's three by three matrices for M and K, it's a three DOF system, which falls more generally under multi-degree of freedom system. The C matrix was zero, so it's undamped. The right-hand side is the zero vector. It's a free system. And I was able to express everything in matrix form, so it's a linear system. Now I wanted the parameters specifically. We wanted natural frequencies and mode shapes for this problem. The natural frequencies using the eigenvalues of m inverse k, doing it symbolically in Mathematica, gave root k over m, root 3k over m, root 8k over m, put in ascending order, which we had to sort, I did manually. And then the associated mode shapes doing that same sort of sort, so 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and negative 1, 0, 1 is the third mode shape. 